Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. Governor Scott is currently on another call with fellow governors and White House officials, but he'll be joining us shortly. Today, I want to provide an update on our progress with the vaccination program, as well as a few policy-related updates. Let's talk about what happened yesterday. We opened 50-plus registration and those were Vermonters age 50 and older. As of this morning, more than 21,000 Vermonters in that age group had made their vaccination appointments. In terms of overall uh, progress, as of this morning, 202,300 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 86,000 have received their first dose of the vaccine. 116,300 have received their first and last dose of the vaccine. We have mentioned in previous press conferences that we anticipated reaching the 200,000 mark by the end of March. When I look at the number of people vaccinated, 202,000 as of today, we are right on that schedule. Nearly 90% of those 70 and older have been vaccinated and 75% of those aged 65 to 69 have been vaccinated. Now let's move on to an update on hospital visitation policy. We, our hospital visitation policy and guidance for inpatient and outpatient healthcare procedures are changing. Today we will issue revised hospital visitation guidelines for those that have been fully vaccinated. Hospitals can now choose to allow fully vaccinated individuals to vis visit patients in their hospitals. These visitors will need to present evidence of vaccination, which includes the COVID-19 vaccination card provided to every uh, vaccinated uh, person. Hospitals do have discretion to use more stringent standards and guidance so as long as they otherwise comply with uh, applicable laws and regulations. Hospitals must continue to apply all safety protocols for visitors and patients, including the requirement that all visitors wear masks during the duration, for the duration of the visit. We have also updated the guidance for healthcare providers and facilities offering inpatient and outpatient procedures under this guidance. Patients will be screened for vaccination status and should be prepared to present evidence of vaccination at their health care appointments. We also, and Dr. Levine will discuss this in more detail in a minute, we're changing some of our registration process. Uh, Commissioner Levine will discuss two new special adjustments to our vaccine strategy. The first is for a group of parents who are caring for children at home who are too young to be vaccinated, but have serious medical conditions and care needs. The second change is to implement further enhancements to our registration process for our BIPOC Vermonters. Each of these adjustments are designed to provide greater access for all Vermonters. The first change will be available on the registration system on Wednesday morning, and the BIPOC change will be available by Thursday on the registration system. You can register by either going online or calling our call center. Just a, a federal pharmacy update, moving on to the federal pharmacy program. As we look toward the goal of offering a vaccine to all Vermonters by July 1st, we continue to add more pharmacy partners and locations. This week, CVS will add locations in Essex, Rutland, and Williston. And starting April 5th, you can make your appointment at 12 Hannaford locations across the state. As a reminder, those age 40 and older will be eligible to make their vaccination appointments starting on April 5th at 8.15 a.m. I encourage everyone to go ahead and create an account online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine so you can simply log on and make your appointment when it's your turn. Go on and register and simply log on 
and make your appointment when 815 on April uh, 5th comes around for those 40 and above. You can make your appointment at one of our healthcare uh, partner clinics, which includes Costco and Walmart through the state website as well at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. If you are unable to sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. One more time, 855-722-7878. You can also make an appointment directly with Kenny Drugs, CVS Pharmacy, or Walgreens. All these options are available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Please, but if you do make an appointment on, um, on the state website and then you make a subsequent appointment at a pharmacy, please cancel the appointment in the state system if you get a vaccine at one of the participating pharmacies. That way it opens up a slot for another Vermonter. Thank you once again for doing your part to end this pandemic and protect yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for our weekly update. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Smith, and uh, good morning, everyone. We first shared uh, CDC modeling about the more contagious COVID-19 variant B117 this past January, which suggested the variant's impact in the U.S. might be significant, and that it was forecasted to become the dominant COVID-19 strand by March. This set up a critical race, as Dr. Levine has mentioned, between the variant and the vaccine. And through much of January and February, with falling case counts and rising vaccination rates, this race certainly seemed well within hand. That was until last week when we saw the emergence of some concerning trends, most notably in Michigan, a state with the highest per capita detection of B117, while also one of the states with the slowest vaccine rollout. Not only were cases rising rapidly in Michigan, but so too were hospitalizations. And now this week, the indication is clearer. Aided by many feeling the general fatigue of COVID-19, the variants seem to be pulling ahead with cases rising in more than 30 states and hospitalizations rising in nearly half the states in the country as well. And we are seeing some of these trends here in Vermont. For example, this week we crossed the 19,000 case threshold. We recorded our single highest case day since the pandemic began. And we came within two cases of tying our highest weekly case rate since the pandemic began, which was set on January 5th. But we must also recognize and acknowledge how fortunate we are to have the vaccine available to us and how fortunate we are to have made so much progress particularly with those that are the most vulnerable as we see this uptick in cases. When we look at the case counts this week compared to the week ending January 5th, the totals are certainly similar, but the risks are very different. On January 5th, about 21% of our cases that week were among the population that was 60 and older. But this week, now with significantly more protection among that age group, those 60 and older only make up about 9% of our cases, and you can see the significant decrease in those 80 and older as well. The trend toward younger cases is something we have seen throughout 2021. As you can see from the chart, cases among those 10 and younger and those 60 and older are disproportionately lower this year. However, when looking at those in their 20s, they represent 13 0.4% of the Vermont population, but they're representing over 20% of our cases so far this year. And the same is true for those 10 to 19 years old as well. As we can see uh, in March in particular, cases among 20 year olds have had a dramatic rise, seeing their share of cases increase 53% so far this month. The reason is clear why we're seeing fewer cases among those uh, in the older populations, simply because they're stepping up and getting vaccinated. 
As Secretary Smith mentioned, over 86% of those 70 and older have started or completed vaccination. And those 65 to 69 uh, saw a 13% increase this week in the number started or completed, moving up from the mid-60s to the mid-70s. And now when we look across the country, we see that Vermont is now leading the nation with the percentage of those 65 and older who have started or completed vaccination, with that percentage continuing to rise each and every day, adding very important protection to our most vulnerable uh, community. Again, the key to ending the pandemic is for all of us to get vaccinated. This individual action will have a significant collective impact. In fact, given our current case rates over the last three months, we estimate that 78 lives have been saved so far from the vaccine being available to us here in Vermont. And many more can be saved when it's our turn to step up and take the vaccine. Looking at our 14-day case rate, you will see that after a relatively stable five weeks, cases have started to climb. But again, among our most vulnerable, those with vaccination percentages over 86%, we continue to see cases among those 70 and older trend down. While overall cases are now only down 11% for those under 70 years old, they are down 81% for those 70 and older, an even greater disparity than what we saw last week. You will also see that there are now six active long-term care facility outbreaks in Vermont, but again, these outbreaks remain considerably smaller than what we experienced earlier in the year. In early January, the average size of a long-term care facility outbreak was over 38 cases, while today that average is down to five. Along with certain age groups uh, driving transmission in Vermont, uh, so too are certain geographic areas of the state. You can see that the case counts remain elevated in the more nor northern counties of Vermont as well as Rutland. Again, as we've said in the past, we all need to keep up the hard work of keeping COVID-19 at bay for a little while longer, but this is particularly true for those uh, living in the parts of the state seeing higher transmission at the moment. Turning to hospitalizations, we see that our trends are pretty stable with the overall hospitalization rate increasing 6% over the last seven days. But when you look at the last 14 days, that rate has decreased about 5%, and we're down nearly 60% from our peak uh, in early February. And as we continue to see fewer cases among individuals 70 and older that have led to hospitalization, with another decrease set for the month of March. And we are also thankfully continuing to see the impact of our higher vaccination rates and lower case counts among our most vulnerable on the weekly daily fatality or the weekly fatality rate with these numbers continuing to trend down over time. The recent rise in cases has added uh, much unpredictability uh, in our forecast this week. The CDC ensemble model, which collects about 30 or so models from across the country, still anticipates our case count to remain relatively stable throughout the month of April. However, the Oliver Wyman model, which we have used since the beginning of the pandemic, anticipates cases will continue to rise before falling at the end of April and into May. You know, these range of outcomes are certainly all possible, but they are certainly also within our control. If we continue to follow the public health guidance, particularly for those in the younger age groups who have been driving transmission recently, and for those living in communities with higher case rates, we will see a more safe glide path into May when vaccine will be available for all age groups in Vermont. We are also on track for fewer deaths in March compared to February, although the deaths in March will be higher than what we had forecasted at the start of the month. Uh, but we still anticipate lower fatality rates into April and plan to provide a longer range forecast next week as well. Looking around the region, we see that cases in the Northeast continue to tick up, increasing 9% compared to last week, adding about 7,700 cases. Taking a look at the regional heat map from early March compared to today, 
you can really see some of the areas of the region that have seen um, their cases worsening, uh, particularly in the New York metro area, as well as uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and also parts of New England as well. And just like the Vermont forecast, uh, we really will need another week's worth of data to confirm the trends that we're seeing in the region. But at the moment, uh, the forecast for the region uh, anticipates that cases will stay high uh, through the month of April. So again, uh, all the more important for everyone to double down on the public health measures, particularly those uh, in the younger age groups and for those that have the availability to get the vaccine to step up and get it and protect themselves uh, and their families. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. <clears throat> As you just heard, we noted on Friday a higher number of cases reported in a single day than we'd been seeing here in Vermont. Those daily reported cases continue to range from the 100s to the 200s. We believe the reasons for this uptick are varied, similar to what's happening in our region and in some other parts of the country. <clears throat> Vermont is certainly not immune from what's happening in surrounding states, especially as more transmissible variants are circulating. We have one of the most restrictive travel policies, and yet people are traveling at a time when it is still not advised. While earlier in the pandemic, we at times existed like an island, during this current surge impacting the Northeast, that is just not possible. We also know because we've all felt it, people are sick of life in a pandemic, plain and simple. That's been true for a while, of course, but our strides in vaccination, the beginning of spring, hope for the future may be enticing us to take increasing risk. And some risks might seem more acceptable to some now that our most vulnerable Vermonters have been protected through vaccination. But wanting the pandemic to be over and it actually being over are not the same thing. We still need to do everything we can to reduce spread of the virus while we vaccinate more and more Vermonters. <clears throat> Fortunately, our positivity rate is still on the lower side for this country right now at 2%, with a relatively small number of hospitalizations that in the last few days have been stable at 25 and two in the ICU. And deaths have slowed dramatically, as you've just seen. And in case you are wondering, it does not appear that our latest cases relate to the minor changes recently made to household gatherings and those rules or restaurant or bar guidance. If we can keep our prevention game strong, we keep our hope for the future alive that time when it really will be safer to do all the things we want to do again. So wear those masks, keep your distance, and avoid crowds for a little longer. Keep gathering small and safe. And parents, please encourage the same for children and teens. And always keep in mind, testing is available around the state, whether you have any symptom or think you could have been exposed. In fact, we are glad to see higher rates of testing right now in Chittenden and Orleans County, as well as in St. Johnsbury and Newport. In fact, testing last week at our on-demand sites increased by 17% over the previous week, with almost 10,000 tests done, and that's not even counting college testing. Finding cases as soon as possible is how we can halt further spread because we get closer to the finish line every day. It's now less than three weeks until all Vermonters are eligible to sign up for their dose of vaccine. We've seen some promising results from Israel, which was experiencing a high number of cases that dropped off precipitously when just 50% of people were vaccinated. And Vermont is already at 35% who have received at least one dose. Another bright spot comes from 
a new CDC study that was just published yesterday that showed that the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines were highly, I emphasize highly without exaggeration, incredibly effective in real world conditions. The almost 4,000 people enrolled in the study were at high risk of being exposed to the virus because they were healthcare workers, first responders, or others on the front lines. According to the report in CDC's MMWR, a two-dose regimen prevented 90% of infections by two weeks after the second dose. Even one dose prevented 80% of infections by two weeks after vaccination. This data confirms the kind of trial data we saw in the clinical trials, but now in real-world circumstances. Please, though, make sure your take-home message is not that one dose of those drugs is sufficient. This study also gives us some insight into the question of virus transmission after vaccination. It suggested that since infections were so rare, transmission is likely rare too. All of the participants did all their own nasal swabs uh, on a continuing basis during the time course of the study. So this data too is adding to the now accumulating evidence on the topic of transmission of virus after vaccination that is often asked about here. And also keep in mind the study was done from December 14th of last year to March 13th of this year. And that is at a time when variants were in greater circulation. Despite these variants, the vaccines provided strong protection. Having more evidence that these vaccines work so well should give us all even more confidence and incentive to get vaccinated as soon as we are eligible. Now I'd like to tell you about two new adjustments to our vaccine strategy. The first is for the relatively small group of parents or primary caregivers who are caring for children at home who are too young to be vaccinated, but are children who have serious medical conditions and care needs. And who would be on our high risk disease list due to their immunocompromised medically complex condition, and they would be prioritized if they were only old enough to qualify for a vaccine at this time. We need to ensure that these parents and caregivers remain healthy enough to care for the child and that they do not risk bringing the virus into the home. Therefore, starting tomorrow, these parents and primary caregivers can now be vaccinated and can register to do so online or by connecting with our call center. Again, that number and all our vaccine information is at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. The second adjustment is for our population of individuals who are BIPOC, black, indigenous, and people of color. Two considerations make it important we act now to further facilitate the vaccination of these members of the Vermont community. Now that all Vermont residents who are at the highest risk of death from COVID, those in the most vulnerable age and high risk condition groups have been vaccinated, we can focus on preventing the other most serious risk of the virus, namely critical illness leading to hospitalization. Data that I have shared here previously reveals the almost twofold increase in risk the BIPOC population has for being hospitalized. Our data also shows us that we have much farther to go with progress in our vaccination efforts. Thus far, the pace of vaccination for BIPOC continues to lag significantly behind with a rate of 20.2% of the population having received at least one dose of vaccine as compared with non-Hispanic whites who have a rate of 33.4%. And this is in spite of our ongoing efforts to offer vaccination of multi-generational households within the current age banding strategy and to engage our community partners in setting up community-based clinics. Nonetheless, it is unacceptable that this disparity remains for this population placed at higher risk. So beginning this Thursday, 
all members of the Vermont BIPOC community, 16 years of age and older, as well as their family members, will be able to register on our website or through the call center to be vaccinated at either state-run community vaccination sites, pharmacies, or at the very well-received community clinics developed with our partners around the state. They will simply need to attest they are a member of the BIPOC community at the time that they register. And finally, it's been a while since I've told a story, so I'm going to end with a short story. A man in his 70s, living in a very rural part of the state with COVID-19, had been experiencing symptoms, severe cough, marked fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion. The symptoms were not improving. Through our health department program, the man was sent a free pulse oximeter. A pulse ox, as it's called, is a small device that clips onto your fingertip to measure your pulse and the oxygen levels in your body. A physician volunteer contacted him within 24 hours of receipt of the pulse oximeter and learned that the morning value had been 83 and a midday value 89. A normal level of oxygen is usually 95 or higher. This condition is called hypoxia. At that point, the volunteer advised him strongly to go to the closest emergency department to be checked out. The next day, he was hospitalized. More than two weeks later, the volunteer got a call from the patient and learned that he'd just been discharged after being in the hospital for two weeks. He was calling to say that our program had saved his life and to thank us. Luckily, this experience is not common, but it does illustrate how it can be difficult to tell when you may be in need of medical care. COVID-19 has become notorious in this regard. Affected individuals just don't recognize when they are hypoxic. People who test positive for COVID can request a pulse ox when they are contacted by the health department. But only about a quarter of people take us up on this offer. So if you do test positive, please consider this extra level of monitoring that could help ensure you receive the medical attention should you need it. Since the governor is still on the phone with the White House, uh, we'll begin our Q&A at this time. I think I actually might wait for the governor for my question. Okay. Okay. I actually might have something for the governor, but uh, since we're talking about expanding the, uh, the sites uh, for the vaccine, uh, some folks had asked us about uh, whether or not we were going to be able to maintain or uh, get to the point that the president's uh, recommendation was that uh, you should be five mile, within five miles of a place where you could get a vaccine. Where are we at with that? <laughs> yeah, that just was uh, announced yesterday by the president. Yeah. And uh, Secretary Smith will come up, but clearly uh, no state has had the chance yet to begin to evaluate uh, their position with regard to that. And I'm not sure that rural states uh, should be looked at in the same way as urban states. Uh, our rule has been that we wanted people to be within, I believe, a half hour of travel time to a site. Um, and I believe we've achieved that. And we're even uh, working further with, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom to make that uh, become real as well. Uh, might as well follow up on the BIPOC situation. Do you see it as, uh, is this sort of a, um, a lack of confidence in the vaccine or, or a lack of confidence in the folks administering uh, the program? I mean, what? do we see here as far as that goes? Yeah, so, community? you know, I can't say that we know the reason or reasons, but I can uh, give you some theories. Obviously, part of it may relate to uh, the fact that there's just needing to be more guidance and education, but that's being provided pretty abundantly. Part of it may be actual access to the vaccine, which is why we've begun these community-based clinics with our partners but they are by no means abundant at this time, so that could still explain part of it. I think a big part of it is actually um, 
you know, every Vermonter in some way has benefited from the strategy we've used, and you've seen the data about how we're having so few cases and so few deaths, thank goodness, in people over 65 or 70. Uh, the BIPOC community does skew younger, um, not just in Vermont, but actually beyond Vermont as well, uh, due to a host of factors. Uh, that have to do with some of the systemic racism that we've talked about previously and the fact that they have more chronic diseases, may live in ad more adverse, uh, adverse circumstances in terms of their housing, live in multi-generational housing more frequently, and often have jobs that are public facing and that require public transportation to get to. So all of those factors work against them when it comes to um, the uh, age-related strategy because many of them are not as eligible until you get into some of the age groups that are further down. Um, we uh, really do not feel that this rate of uh, vaccination for that community um, is something we could ignore. Uh, this is a very data-driven approach. We have good data on hospitalizations and even some data from hospitalizations that say that the younger ages are getting hospitalized, uh, perhaps in their 20s. And we have now good data from our vaccine over the last couple of months to really tell us that we need to expand as much as possible the opportunity that members of that community have to access the vaccine. Thanks, Rebecca. I did have a question for the Gov, but while Dr. Levine is there, I had one um, for Dr. Levine as well. Um, from a viewer who asks um, if the state or why the state isn't following uh, CDC guidance on people who've had an adverse reaction to the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines, um, and who want the J and J vaccine? Uh, this woman said she could not get the J and J shot because she'd had a Moderna shot, had a bad reaction to it, and doesn't feel comfortable getting a second Moderna shot. Given that, um, what should she do? Well, first of all, we should review the fact that we do adhere to the CDC guidance, um, and people who have had one shot of a two dose series and had an adverse reaction um, would be eligible to get one dose of the one dose series, the J&J, &J, at a future time. So um, the problem at the present time is just the amount of that vaccine that we have in the state. Uh, so that strategy will work uh, when the uh, vaccine becomes more abundant, which will be in the very near future, we hope. Speaking of that, though, the governor, okay. the governor may actually be able to shed more light on that since he's just arrived and has heard from the White House about how much of what we might be getting. So this would be a good time to segue to him, and then you can ask your second question to him. All right, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Dr. Levine mentioned, I just got off the phone with fellow governors in the White House for our weekly call. First, it looks like we're going to receive about five to 6,000 more doses this week than last between both the state and federal pharmacy programs. Uh, this includes a small bump of uh, Pfizer and Moderna. That's the two-dose vaccines. But this is mainly due uh, to a significant increase in Johnson & Johnson. Uh, the federal par uh, pharmacy program alone will see a near doubling of its allocation. Uh, and it's, while well, it's good news uh, that the federal pharmacy program is getting more, uh, but uh, we heard there were some questions by fellow governors and, and I continue to express concern over the lack of coordination between that program and the states. So they are going to be watching uh, for any um, any cases where there's stockpiling uh, going on or not utilizing their allocation uh, so that we can get more doses in arms. Um, they also said that the supply overall uh, will remain flat next week, and we were told to expect J&J uh, &J, uh, to fluctuate uh, both up and down 
over the next couple of weeks. They just don't have a good handle on the supply chain there. So that's about it uh, for um, in regards to the supply. Um, and now I'll continue, as you saw in Commissioner Pichek's modeling, Vermont and the rest of New England has seen a rise in cases over the past couple of weeks. This comes as we continue to make progress on vaccines, particularly among those at risk uh, of death from COVID. As you heard, we rank first in the nation for those over 65 who've received at least one dose. And as a result, even while cases have gone up in general, they've actually gone down significantly amongst those uh, most vulnerable, those over 65. This shows that vaccines work. So when it's your turn, I would advocate and we'd urge you to please sign up. We're very encouraged to see how our vaccination strategy has reduced hospitalizations and death, which has been our goal since the very start of the pandemic. But now that we're just three weeks away from everyone becoming eligible to sign up for their shot, we must step up uh, in our efforts to slow the spread of this very contagious virus. Because even though the most vulnerable have had their chance to be protected, cases can still slow down our recovery. We've seen the average age of our cases decrease. And although it's true, younger people are far less likely to suffer severe outcomes from COVID, it's not impossible. But importantly, even asymptomatic cases can have a ripple effect, whether it be in the classroom, in the office, or on the job site. As we work to get more kids back in school full time and get back to some sort of normal, it's more important than ever to recommit to the public health guidance we have in place. Because contrary to what you might see on Twitter or other social media platforms, uh, we haven't thrown the spigot open, although we have taken some small steps forward. But it's important to remember, Vermont still has among the strongest, if not the strongest, mitigation measures in place throughout the Northeast and in the country. For instance, we still have limits on gatherings, like keeping it to new two non-vaccinated households at a time. And while we made some small spigot turns for restaurants, bars, and social clubs like the Legion and the VFW, we still have more stringent measures in place than Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and others in the region. This includes capacity limits, distancing, hours of operation, seating requirements, masking, and more. I bring this up because while we continue to take small incremental steps forward, I don't want people to think we've rolled everything back and you can let your guard down. Vaccinations and vigilance are the strongest tools we have in this race, and we need to work hard in order to win. On the other hand, I know there are also many who think I'm moving way too slow to reopen. I hear from them every single day. But as I've said, we're going to continue to take a methodical and strategic approach like we have from the start. The good news is with vaccinations speeding up, it's not that far away. And as I've said, in the coming days, I'll present a blueprint showing how we'll work our way back to normal, which will be based in part on the percent of the population being vaccinated. So with that, we'll get back to the questions. I had a question for the governor, so I'll go back to Calvin. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask about the pension problem that's uh, unfolding. As you may have heard, there's uh, state employees and teachers that are, are protesting today and, and later this week as well. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I guess, from, from your thoughts, you know, does the plan that was submitted by the legislature, does it go too far? And is the state breaking its promise that it made to these these teachers and state employees? Well, again, I think they presented a plan. It hasn't gone through any committees at this point yet. It hasn't gone to the House and, and had a vote in, on the House floor, nor has it gone to the Senate. It's a plan. It's a concept. We have a $5.7 billion combined problem, unfunded liability. Uh, and this problem's not going away. Just ignoring it isn't going to make it go away. So I give great credit 
to the legislature, to the House in general, the Speaker, for bringing this up. And uh, because it's been ignored for far too long. We've seen the warning signs uh, for decades and uh, have ignored them. So now um, it's time to do something. Now, I'm sure it'll have a lot of twists and turns along the way, uh, but we need to ha get something accomplished. So I'm supportive of their efforts. Uh, we'll see again what happens as a result of some of the uh, dialogue that's been going on uh, between uh, the, the House uh, Committee and some of the advocates and uh, see where they go from here. But until it's presented in bill form and, and passed out of committee and then, then goes through all the other uh, um, ups and downs and, and turns, um, it's hard to say what it will look like when it comes out the end. That you oppose um, the uh, uh, attacks on the state's top earners, but you know, should should taxpayers, in some sort, contribute? Um, you know, whether it's not the top earners, but I mean, should should taxpayers contribute something towards? Well, I think process? we are. You know, I think that's how it's funded to begin with. Um, in fact, 150 million dollars doesn't come out of uh, thin air, um, so it's coming out of taxpayers. Uh, uh, and, and rightly so. I mean, that's, that's what this whole system's about. It's just that it's, it's not sustainable uh, the way it is right now. We, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars uh, on this obligation, uh, but, um, but we can't keep up, and we can't keep up at this rate. Just one side question as well. It appears as though the Senate uh, today voted on that unemployment bill. Um, the latest version, from my understanding, takes out the 20%. Uh, unemployment uh, benefit increase, but it still keeps the $50 uh, a week for dependent benefit. Um, what, what are your thoughts of what's coming out of the Senate, and in, are you uh, supportive of it? In its first well, time? again, uh, I don't think this is the time to add things. Uh, we've, uh, I think the, the unemployment benefit with the federal uh, allotment has been quite beneficial. And, uh, and generous in a lot of respects. It went from 600, it's now at 300 uh, each and every week extra. So I don't know all the uh, terms of what was passed. Uh, and again, this is just passed possibly, it's not even fully probably passed out of the Senate, although I haven't been following it today. Um, so it still has to go to the, uh, go to the House uh, for their reaction, but I, I would like to keep it as simple as possible. And, uh, and trying to move forward and, and continue this debate uh, in, uh, in the next, uh, during, this, during this legislative session and beyond. Um, but right now we need, um, we need some relief uh, for those, uh, the businesses uh, that are going to be on the hook. Now I've heard many describe uh, what's in the bill as a, uh, as a break, uh, a tax break uh, for businesses. Uh, it isn't a tax break. It's just a deferment. They're still going to have to pay. It's just they can't, shouldn't be subjected to this type of a, of a increase in the amount uh, that they will have to pay this year. I mean, they're still suffering. They're still struggling, and um, and we need them uh, to recover from this pandemic. Thanks, Governor. I'm all set, Rebecca. Hi, uh, you can hear me? I can. Okay, thanks. Uh, for now, was there I any can. mention of Was there any mention of the Canadian border, uh, Governor? I know you've asked that a couple of times. Uh, any hint uh, and uh, discussion about a vaccine document? Yeah, um, oh. no, nothing specific about the border. Uh, but there was another question by another governor. Uh, I think it was uh, uh, North Carolina. Uh, actually, Governor Cooper, uh, that it asked about some sort of a passport, some sort of a vaccination card. Um, and the, the bottom line is they're working on something, but it doesn't sound like it will be any database that is run by the federal government. Um, so I think that's uh, you know comforting news to some. Uh, they're not going to keep track of that, but I don't know who's going to. So uh, they said that they would have uh, um, the White House said that they would have something out in the next couple of weeks, um, so we'll have to wait and see. But they didn't, they didn't really give any indication as to who was going to run it and, uh, and how it was going to be utilized. 
Well, that being said, New York has uh, moved ahead with a, a sort of a card system. Would you be open to that as well? Well, we do have a card system, I think, now in some respects. Uh, everyone that receives a vaccine will get a card um, and, and so that they have some record of being vaccinated. So I would anticipate, I mean, we'll, we'll still have that. And in fact, our travel has been based on those who are vaccinated can freely go in and out of the state. Um, so we're, we're already using uh, that vaccination card at this point. Okay, thanks very much. Wilson to AP. Uh, hi, Good morning everybody. Uh, these rising cases, is there anything new that can be done to try and stop them? I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, you know, the, the measures that Vermont has had in place for a long time, but they don't seem to be stopping things. Uh, is, is there anything that can be done besides just waiting for more of the population to get vaccinated? Uh, I'll let um, Dr. Levine talk about this, but this came up. Dr. Lewinsky, um, the director of the CDC, talked about her concern about the uptake of cases across the country, 13% increase this week. Uh, hospitaliz hospitalization and deaths, uh, she said, have been increasing about uh, 6% uh, across the country. And she, uh, she said that Europe had uh, the same trajectory uh, before they experienced their spike. Um, she, her guidance was to recommit, uh, to double down, um, to, um, to re-implement uh, masking, distancing, and uh, avoiding crowds which, as you know, uh, we have continued to do. Um, so it's tough. Uh, you know, her advice was to, I think, pointing at states that have uh, lifted their mask mandate or any of their uh, public health guidance. And um, we haven't done that here. You know, we're, we're still advocating. We have a, a masking mandate. And I, as I see, as I'm traveling around the state and, and going into different um, entities, I, I see that people are still wearing their masks, which is great. Um, they're saying just keep your distance, avoid crowds, and again, we advocate for the same. So I think uh, I don't, I'll let Dr. Levine uh, see if he can answer further, but uh, what President Biden and Dr. Walensky have been uh, advocating for, we're already doing. And I certainly concur with all of that. Uh, they really have, and I'll add Dr. Fauci's name to the list, uh, and my own name to the list, have been pointing in a non-targeted way, but pointing at states that basically just said it's time to reopen. And it was like night and day, uh, all of a sudden. Um, never the approach that we've taken in Vermont. But, um, that seems to be, from the federal government's viewpoint, uh, what needs to be done now is just for everyone to adhere to all the guidance like we've been preaching here, but also not um, rescind or go back on any of the mandates that are out there. The, the tongue-in-cheek answer, and I'm not advocating this for the United States over Vermont today, is a lockdown. Uh, we know from our own experience, stay home, stay safe, shuts down cases, pretty quickly. If people really can't interact with one another, they don't have the ability to transmit the virus. The virus gets suppressed, and uh, that's an effective means. Unfortunately, you're seeing countries throughout Europe resorting to that now um, in this latest surge that they're experiencing. And though I quoted Israel's uh, statistics, which are quite good with their vaccine strategy, about a month or so before that, um, they had come out of a lockdown. Uh, so this does happen throughout the world, even in places where the virus is controlled, like uh, Australia, uh, in a targeted way, locking down parts of the country where they've seen uh, resurgences. Not advocating for that here, not advocating for that now, um, uh, but that is, of course, a mitigation strategy taken to the extreme that would be effective. We would hope that this race that I keep referring to of vaccination increasing um, at a time with adherence to all of the other guidances 
uh, would get us to the same finish line, if you will. Um, and it's heartening to hear about more vaccine coming. Uh, you know, we could use even more uh, to get there even faster. But that's really the solution in the end. Um, okay, great. And Governor, what was the, uh, you mentioned, what was the figure you used? Five to 6,000 more doses next week than uh, last. What's the total amount we're receiving now about? Uh, I think it's, let's see, 21. I think it's around 28, 28,000, I believe. For this week? Or for next week? The state allocation. Okay. 21. Great. Oh, wait. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 21 this week, or about 22. So we think we're going to get around 28,000 next week. Okay. Right. Okay. Great. I thank you both. All I can say. Let me see if I can clear this up a little bit. I don't know what the amount was uh, for last week. I don't have it with me, uh, but it's we feel that we're going to get five to six thousand more doses than we got last week. What complicates last week just a little bit, uh, not to try and complicate this any further, but we did receive a one-time allocation last week that isn't counted in this week's allocation. So we got a one-time bump last week of a few thousand doses. So again. The, the increase from last week is going to be, including the one time, is going to be about five to 6,000 doses. It's good news. Okay. Thank you very much. Craig, the County Courier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, last week I asked about the validity of the vaccine data. Uh, the numbers seem to have been fluctuating uh, one age group in Grand Isle County reached upwards of 102%, and now I believe they're down like 95%. Dr. Levine, I, I think you were going to look into that before you, you have to look into it before you uh, made too much of a comment. Have you had a chance to do that before I jump into my two questions for today, or are you still looking into those? That's two questions there. Uh, Secretary Smith. Greg, I, I said we would reach out to you to get a better handle on that. We tried to reach out to you on um, at least one occasion. I don't know if we did it twice, uh, but Andrea is trying to reach out to you just to understand what you're looking at. So she'll make an attempt again today, Greg, to reach out to you, and uh, let's let's just settle it for the, let's get the information that we need uh, from your perspective. Let's look at it, and I'll have an answer on uh, Friday. Okay, awesome. Uh, Governor, a, a wedding venue reached out to us wondering what to expect for restrictions in May and June. Many weddings that are scheduled for, for May and June were rescheduled from a year ago. And if you remember at that time, they were told basically delay your, your event for a year, you'll be fine. You know, understanding the caveat that things can change, what can people expect for uh, gathering restrictions for the months of May and June as you see it now. Yeah, I can I can go into more detail uh, when I present the blueprint, which we'll be doing uh, within the week, but um, but I'm not prepared to do that today. So we can probably expect something more on Friday. Uh, within the week, that that today's what Tuesday, so one week within within the week. Within. Within a week Friday's now. within okay. a week, but Tuesday uh, is too. Okay. And uh, lastly, uh, Governor, as a construction worker, you know many towns right now are uh, experiencing mud season much harder than normal uh, with a with a faster warm-up than typical in the, in the past 10 days. Many, many back roads have, have become so broken up that they're impassable. Uh, schools have had to close because they can't get their school, their, their students and teachers there. Uh, and, and even maybe some emergency vehicles are unable to get to quite a few homes. I'm wondering what the state can do to help these rural residents stay safe and, and if VTrans has resources that, that are available to small towns when 
they're already so stretched thin they can't do any more. Um, first of all, and and I don't, uh, I'm not being insensitive, but I, I hear this I think every single year. And in fact, I say it myself. Uh, I live on a back road, uh, so I experience it on a daily basis. So every uh, every year, I think it's never been worse than this year. Uh, but it, it's about typical, from my perspective, it's about typical. Our our road uh, going to my house is uh, almost impassable. Uh, there's one road that uh, close to there that has been closed down, as it typically is every single year. Having said that, um, I, we will do anything we can to help out in any way possible. Uh, but this is, you know, this is mud season. The frost is coming out of the ground. It is coming out quick. Um, that may uh, help in some respects in, in terms of the longevity if we can get a few days of uh, warm weather with the frost coming out quickly, um, it won't last as long. So uh, stay tuned if there's any uh, communities that are uh, needing assistance, uh, we will do everything we can to help. Um, but, uh, and if that, I don't know if they need aggregate, I don't know if they need equipment, uh, I'm just not sure what they need at this point, but sometimes you just have to somewhat uh, close the road down uh, before you can do much uh, of anything other than putting uh, more aggregate, more stone uh, in place. So should town officials reach out to VTRAN? So how does that work? I, I you know, again, um, if they have any issues, I, I, would, uh, I would have them reach out to their maintenance districts. We'll see what we can do. I'm not promising anything, but, uh, but we'll do everything we can to, to assist them. If there's some technical, from a technical aspect, if there's uh, aggregate that's needed that we may have or they want to borrow, um, I'm sure that we can, we can do something to help um, if it's uh, something they can't handle themselves. But most of the towns, I know my uh, town of Berlin is, uh, has been well prepared and uh, has a quite a stockpile of aggregate and has been working on the roads consistently. And they've done a pretty good job, I think, thus far. Thank you, Governor. You have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you on Friday. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Donahue, the Islander. <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. Governor, uh, maybe one quick question. Uh, with all the issues Governor Cuomo is facing, do you think it's time for him to uh, step aside? And was he on the call today? He, he was on the call, um, and uh, that question didn't come up. But do you think he ought to step aside I with think, all the issues I, he's facing? I think he should do what he thinks is right. Um, you know, there is a, a series of allegations uh, mounting. Um, I'm sure those uh, there's a lot of people in, in New York uh, that are debating this issue as we speak. Uh, but... Um, but I think it's up to him and the people of New York. So you and your colleagues have not offered him any advice that you know of? He did not ask for our advice. <laughs> That's probably not he a surprise. He hasn't asked you all the way no. through this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we had previously asked about the state encouraging Vermonters not to work because of the extra benefits uh, being offered for refusing jobs like the bar and restaurant. I know you were going to have some plans in the future, but uh, I was just wondering, we, since asking that, and we've heard from more employers who are frustrated and appears to be more widespread than I was led to believe initially based on what I'm hearing from these people. And it's just that Vermont makes it lucrative paying out benefits and welfare. It, as you probably know, Vermont number one or one of the top states in giving out benefits. Is there any thought of cutting back to $700 tax-free each week, not to work uh, some way to encourage people to, to go back to work? We'll be uh, implementing the work search requirements uh, sometime in the next uh, month or so, two months. Um, but it all depends on the vaccine, the allotment, getting people back to work uh, because there are some, some who are home because they you know, have no one to take care of the kids and the kids aren't in school. Uh, so they're led, uh, they have to, uh, somebody has to take care of them and they're staying home because of that. And I think that's a legitimate um, issue. So 
uh, until we get more people back to work, uh, we're not going to implement something that they can't adhere to. So, uh, but at the same time, as soon as we get more people vaccinated, the kids get back to school, uh, we'll be able to uh, implement those work search requirements because there are, you know, there are over 30,000 uh, still uh, on, uh, um, um, involved with the unemployment assistance in some capacity, whether it's the PUA or the traditional uh, unemployment. So uh, we want to get them back to, to work just as quick as we possibly can, because I know employers need them. Uh, they're, they're ramping back up. Well, yeah, and I think that's their frustration is that they're, you know, and this is prime time, especially for the restaurants and the bars that are trying to reopen and to get the tourist season going. I mean, they're completely frustrated. And I think they're looking for leadership here as to how to get these people that, you know, were working a year ago and now just say, hey, no, I'd rather stay home and collect $700 tax free rather than maybe getting $1,000 taxable and having to work 40 hours. I mean, yeah. Well, again, I'm it sensitive. Certainly is a disincentive to work. It's a disincentive to work. I, again, I'm, That's what they're saying. I, I'm sensitive to those who can't go to work because they have child care uh, issues. And uh, as we experienced up in the St. Albans area, there was the YMCA that closed down. Um, so... Um, there's a number of families that were impacted because of that, and I, I'm sure uh, there are uh, great needs throughout Vermont for child care um, because the schools, a lot of the schools aren't back to full in-person instruction, and, and, uh, and it's not a consistent, when they are back uh, to in-person instruction, it's not consistent. So the answer is uh, trying to get more vaccinations, uh, get the vaccine supply increase, uh, so that we can get through this. Uh, and I know it's difficult for everyone on both sides of, of the coin on that one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Quick time check here, it's 12.15 and we still have 16 folks left in the queue. Liam, VPR. <laughs> Hi, um, I was wondering with the uh, expanded eligibility for uh, BIPOC Vermonters that's opening up on Thursday, um, how that will affect distribution of the vaccines to um, people that are currently incarcerated in the state. Um, they will be included uh, just uh, the same as the age bands, but I mean, meaning that they will, they will be vaccinated under this provision. Okay. Is there any um, plan to, to just sort of make sure that they're aware and can sign up? I mean, I, you know, it's sort of curious what the, the rollout uh, would be for, for that situation. Yeah, Liam, let me uh, explain what the rollout is. Uh, they don't sign up. We bring the vaccine to them uh, as, um, as uh, the, the provider of health care to, uh, to those facilities um, through the contractor. We did, um, just to let you know where we are and what the plans are, um, we have uh, completed the 70 plus uh, in terms of their first dose. I'm talking about first dose in terms of what we're doing. Um, we hope to have the first dose in every uh, person in the Department of Corrections done by April 19th. Uh, we, we, the 70 plus have all been vac uh, vaccinated at least one dose. Uh, that started on February 2nd. Uh, those 55 and plus with qualifying uh, health conditions, uh, that started on uh, March 8th uh, with their first dose. Uh, I'm, I'm just talking first dose here because I'm gonna give you a sort of an end date with all second doses. Uh, we did, uh, DOC did complete the 60 plus uh, with first dose. They started on 60 plus on March 18th. Um, 50 plus will start on March 25th, um, or has started on March 25th. I'm losing track of, of time. 40 plus will start on April 5th, and 30 plus will start on April 12th. And we hope to have uh, 
all age tiers completed by May uh, 13th. That, in, that includes um, second doses. So everybody should be vaccinated, completely vaccinated um, with their second dose by May 13th. But that's the time schedule uh, you know, in, in those age bands. And by April 19th, all ages within the Department of Corrections, inmates within the Department of Corrections will be vaccinated uh, in that week of April 19th. Okay, um, I, so they, everybody by, the, by April 19th will, will have been vaccinated. And do you have a current um, uh, just sort of breakdown of what the uptake has been among the incarcerated population at this time? I don't, Liam, but let me get back to you. I'll, uh, I'll get to corrections and uh, f find out. And remember, that vaccination that I gave you was first dose. Second dose um, won't, be, uh, won't be done until like May 13th of all, all those uh, uh, inmates that I talked about. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, there have been a, a very large number of cases up in my area in Orleans County, and it appears from what I've read that um, the rate of vaccination in that area is also quite low. Um, are you, number one, uh, are you ha aware of what might be behind the high rate of uh, COVID in the area, if there's anything specific to say. I know sometimes there isn't. And in any event, are there plans to specifically target the kingdom um, to improve the situation here? I know we've been working to try and improve the situation. I don't know whether Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith wants to answer. Dr. Levine first. We're going to divide and conquer on this one with cases and vaccine strategies. Um, so you saw on the um, map that we showed earlier today that pretty much northern Vermont is more activity um, than southern Vermont with the exception of Rutland County. Um, so it's hard to say that there's anything specific driving this. It's really been community transmission, and that means um, it's out there. We see it in work sites, we see it in schools, we see it in healthcare facilities, we see it in um, occasional long-term care facilities. It's really across all sectors of society, and it's hard to point at one sort of inciting event or outbreak or anything of that sort, because that's just not happening there. We do know that the prison accounted for a fair number of cases, but having said that, it's probably the disease being brought into the prison uh, and leading to those cases as opposed to uh, the other direction. So I'll let Secretary Smith uh, give you some of the statistics he's got in his hand uh, for the rest of the question. Joe, just let me uh, give you vaccination rates in, in that area. Um, and this is either started or completed uh, in terms of vaccination rates. Uh, your county, Orleans, that you were talking about is 17.7%. It's not really way off from other counties that are out there. The average is 19.4%. But if you look at other counties, they're all hovering around a lot of them are hovering around uh, 17 to 18 percent. So Orleans isn't uh, too much of an outlier in terms of uh, that uh, population with the other um, counties. Where we do see a disparity is in Essex, and I've talked about this on several occasions. And we've tried different strategies, and we'll continue to try different strategies, including mobile clinics in that area. We're trying to work out um, the details on that now, but um, but Essex County is at 13.9% of the population and uh, either started or completed. And I just uh, 
uh, percent vaccinated either started or completed. And that is, that is a, a disparity between the other counties. And as I mentioned before, we're keeping an eye on that and trying to uh, figure out what's going on. Thank you very much. Good day. Uh, Governor, my question is actually going to go to the uh, controversial uh, decision to put surveillance powers up on the Canadian border. Um, there's, of course, the consideration uh, that we need to uh, protect the borders, but people up here are feeling that it's kind of a big brother invasive um, system to have, and they feel that it can potentially be abused. Can you kind of speak to how people can balance uh, and how our government can balance protecting the borders uh, without becoming too invasive or having people feel like their cameras in their bedroom? Well, again, um, this is not a state initiative. Uh, this is a federal initiative. This is the Biden administration. Right. So it's probably a better question for them, better question for our uh, congressional delegation than it is the state uh, delegation, uh, myself included. Um, but I think there is a way to have a balance. I, I believe that there's, there's got to be a, an approach uh, that protects the border, but also protects uh, individual rights. So um, I, I would be seeking that. Uh, we'll be in contact uh, with the congressional delegation, but, but I would, um, I think, I would, I would point towards them or the Biden administration uh, to see what their plans are. Yeah, the congressional delegation did get together and issue a press release on it. I'm just asking you, just on, on your level, because you're dealing with residents of the state of Vermont, um, that is there any way there can be assurances that they'll be protected so surveillance material can't be used against them in a state court? Um, well, again, I, th I think this is something that has to be worked out by the by the feds, um, and we'll provide input. We want to protect uh, our citizens, but I would say our congressional delegation has the same interests, uh, protecting individual rights and, and our citizens here in Vermont. They're representing them too. So um, we'll work uh, towards finding whatever compromise is uh, necessary. Uh, I know their charge is to provide uh, enforcement along the border, protect the border, and uh, again, we want to protect uh, the rights of our citizens. So we'll we'll continue uh, to advocate for that, and uh, I, I would imagine the uh, congressional delegation will as well. Very good. Thank you very much, Governor. First, I want to thank you for your announcement about the high-risk families. I've already heard from a couple of them who I spoke with recently who said they're very relieved to hear that they can now sign up to protect their kids. I am curious, though, why weren't they addressed earlier in this vaccination process? I, I would say, um, I'll let Dr. Levine answer, but, uh, you know, we, we didn't have, nor do we today, have an infinite supply of uh, vaccine coming to us. Uh, we're forced to, and it's not comfortable, forced to prioritize. Um, we, get, we get requests every single day about someone wanting to get to the front of the line, uh, but uh, with a limited supply, uh, we wanted to get to those uh, who are at most risk of hospitalization and death, uh, and that didn't, unfortunately, rise to that level at that point in time. With the increased amount of uh, supply, uh, we felt that it's, uh, it was appropriate for us to take action to do whatever we could to protect uh, them and their families. Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine has nothing to add to that unless you want to interrogate him. No. Um, I do you have a couple of logistical questions though, that I've gotten from the parents? Do they need a special code when they sign up? No. No, they do not need a special code when they sign up. And does this change, just so I'm clear in my reporting, apply to all caregivers or just the caregivers of the kids who can't be vaccinated due to their age and who are high risk? The latter, caregivers of kids who are at risk. 
Perfect. And then do you have an estimation for how many families in Vermont this will make a difference for? You know, that's a really hard number for us to come across. Certainly, if we look at our children with special health needs group, that's under 50. Uh, but not every child is in that group because that's a special set of diagnoses. Uh, I can't really give you a, an estimate that I would really want to hang my hat on, so I, I won't go further than that. We don't think it's a Perfect. large, Thank large, you very we, much. yeah, we don't think it's a large, large number, that's for sure. Got it. Thank you. Devin, local 22. Hi, my question is for Governor Scott. Um, I was wondering if you have any indication of the timeline for pharmacies, more of them coming online. Um, there are some that are ready, everyone is trained, um, but they haven't been told if there'll be a vaccine site yet. Um, what's your indication once we get to these later age groups, how many pharmacies could sort of be playing a role in the rollout? I know we're adding them as we speak. I'll let Secretary Smith uh, maybe answer that further. Thanks, Devin. Um, we are adding locations. Uh, CBS, for example, I said we'll add locations in Essex, Rutland, and Williston. And we are adding a pharmacy uh, starting April 5th. Uh, you can make appointments at 12 Hannaford locations across the state. What we're just trying to make sure as we add on pharmacies that we stay coordinated with one another. We've seen some um, uh, some issues with staying coordinated with the federal pharmacy program and we just want to make sure that we do this in a methodical way as we're bringing on more and more pharmacies. Also they're limited to, even with the federal pharmacy program, they're limited to the amount of vaccine that they have as well. So um, it's not like we can bring everybody on and then they have vaccine. That's not, that's not the case. Um, so we will we'll be we'll continue to be methodical. Uh, we're trying to hit as many locations and as many people as possible with the addition of Hannaford across the state and with the addition of more clinics uh, through CVS. Uh, we continue to um, and and of course we have Costco, we have uh, Walgreens, uh, we have Walmart that are included, uh, and Kinney Drugs, which is, are included in our pharmacy program. Great, and then a uh, question for Dr. Levine. Um, you had briefly mentioned the, the news that one shot of Pfizer Moderna um, has 80% efficacy, but mentioning the, you know, the takeaway here should not be that one shot um, is good enough. And the Surgeon General seems to agree with that. Um, he said the caveat about that is we don't know how long that protection lasts. Um, could you just expand on that a little bit and kind of talk about you know, the importance of people not just getting one shot and then assuming they're good to go because they see that 80% number. Just uh, a little bit more about behind that, the uncertainty with it. Yeah, thanks for helping reinforce that major message. Um, so, you know, the way the trials were done for these two dose vaccines is specifically uh, with everyone getting the second dose. So, sure, they did look at efficacy after one dose. Uh, but that was never to avoid doing what they wanted to do. It's very common in trying to induce immunity in a person through a vaccine that uh, you follow um, the titers of what uh, antibodies are being uh, produced and then see the impact on the durability of those antibody titers by adding booster doses. And so this is a fairly common um, concept and generally uh, works very well. You know, we all know that there are various vaccines we've used in our lives that one shot is not enough and that we have to go back and um, get more. So um, th this, this is just using basic vaccine and immunology uh, science uh, and understanding that the one dose while adequate for a period of time, may not be adequate for the duration that you'd like it to be. Great, thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Records. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Probably for Dr. Levine, I'm wondering if he can provide us any updates on the situation with the busing company in Caledonia County and the outbreak investigation that's unfolding with that. Yeah, I'm not sure it's much of an update, but because you're assuming everyone who's listening to this understands what we're talking about, I'll just say that there is a bus company in Caledonia County that services a number of the school systems there, and there were cases associated with that. The school systems are aware of it. The superintendents were aware of it. The superintendents sent out communications to all of the parents so that they would know that they would not be picked up by the bus on Monday morning this week. And um, it's an ongoing investigation, but the reality is we're already aware of cases. The company is aware of the cases. They're aware of the guidance we've provided regarding the need for the cases to isolate and for other drivers who became close contacts or other members of that uh, company who became close contacts for the need for them to quarantine. So it's pretty straightforward um, containment strategy and use of important public health guidance. Um, I can't speak to um, when that company will begin picking kids up again, et cetera, um, because this is all fairly new over the weekend and it has to play out for a short period of time yet. Do you, uh, do you have a count on how many, um, how many positive cases and close contacts are associated with it? I don't have a count for you. Um, at the moment, um, when the, the very earliest part of this, the count um, was not high and no, we don't usually uh, discuss counts when they're not high and we needed to understand and I'm not sure we yet understand how many employees there are of the company in total because there are rules regarding um, providing that public information that hinge on the number of counts and the number of employees. Okay. Are you, uh, do you know whether there's been any um, transmission um, within the actual functioning of, of the bus routes, for instance, you know, from right. driver to kids or from kid to kid or anything like that. Right, so that's important news. And so far, we are not aware of any uh, within the bus transmission. But again, this is still early, so I, I can't be definitive about that. It's uh, only been a few days. Okay. Um, if you had to guess, I realize you don't understand the, um, the operational capacity of a busing company, but do you see this being resolved by next week, or do you think the busing shutdown is going to extend beyond, uh, you know, beyond this one week that most of the schools have announced the, the yeah, cancellation? Yeah, it re it'd really be impossible for me to say because we'd have to know how many of the contacts become true cases, uh, how big the company is, and how many drivers they actually have total, and how many of them are not impacted by what just happened. So I, I can't really give you, uh, I wouldn't want to give a guess and then uh, over promise or um, anything like that. Just don't have insight into that right now. Um, one last on this topic. Uh, this busing company has several regional hubs uh, elsewhere in Vermont and uh, Fable, New Hampshire and, and other locations. Do you know whether uh, the situation extends just beyond the, its, its Lindenville hub? Uh, I am not aware of I am not aware of anything outside of your county, but and I'm so and I've not been told that any anything else has occurred. Okay, um, and if I may, uh, you already addressed much of this with Joe's question earlier about the, the real rise in cases uh, in the kingdom. Um, just from a 30,000 foot view, if you will, um, given the recent surge in cases in the kingdom and uh, uh, the, the relatively low vaccination uptake, at least in comparison to the rest of the state, um, you've described, uh, the, you know, Vermont as being in a race between the vaccines and the virus. 
Would you say that the kingdom is losing that race at this point? And what are the consequences if it is? No, I would say we're still early in the race, so I, I wouldn't want to dare say anyone's winning or losing. Uh, clearly, we are winning the race when it comes to the data we've shown you about older Vermonters and the fact that they're not accounting for many of the current cases, and certainly that the death rate across Vermont is markedly decreased when it comes to COVID. So at that part of the race, protecting the most vulnerable, we're clearly winning. I wouldn't want to uh, comment on a vaccination rate and a case rate sort of competing within a specific county. Um, we will get there uh, for sure. Vaccination is not sort of an outbreak response strategy. It's a long-term preventive strategy. So I would hope that when eligible, all members of the state and certainly of those counties avail themselves of the opportunity to get their vaccine as quickly as possible. Hi, thanks. Um, I know that this has come up in earlier press conferences, but I'm wondering if there's any progress been made with the um, people who are homebound, a lot of them who don't use computers. I know there are services providing mobile vaccination, but I'm wondering, do you know how many of these people are being missed? Because we are hearing from uh, their caretakers saying that they just, uh, they can't, uh, they can't get somebody to come to the house to give these people vaccines. Uh, Secretary Smith. I haven't, and I haven't heard of anybody being missed, but if they are, um, the next press conference, I'll, I'll provide the phone number. I don't have it off the top of my head, the phone number that they should call. I know in Chittenden County, we had a little bit of backlog that we're working through right now, and that is, um, and it's, it, I think we should be, um, caught up uh, by the end of this week or early next week. But I haven't heard that we're missing people, and I will provide the uh, phone number for people to call. We don't want to miss anyone. We want to make, we have the capacity to bring a vaccine to people that are homebound. Um, we need to use it. We've done over 3,000, I think it's 3,000. Um, visits and, and doses to people that are homebound. And I want to make sure that we do, uh, we built that capacity to be used and we need to use it. Do you, do you know how many people total are homebound if 3,000 have had their uh, visits and doses? Yeah, I, I don't know how many are homebound. Um, and we, as you know, we relied initially from home health and then we asked people that if they weren't with home health, we sort of combed uh, hospitals and primary care uh, 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 providers to see if uh, we could uh, suss out other people that were uh, homebound that may not be on a list any place. And then we just said, please call. And uh, that's what we're doing right now. We're in that phase of please call. Okay, but if you don't know how many there are, how do you know that haven't that none have been missed? Well, I, I haven't said none have been missed. What I said is we're trying to get as many people that are homebound as possible. Um, I'm trying not to miss anybody is what the goal is here. And, you know, I don't think uh, we can, you know, look, we're, we're trying to do a vaccination program that hasn't been ever done before. We're just trying to make sure that we get everybody possible that we can. And we set up a whole separate program in order to uh, serve the homebound. And I'm hoping um, that people that are listening that are homebound, we're trying to get the message out, as I said, through the various avenues that we have, home health, primary care, local hospitals, to figure out how we can hit everybody. I don't think anybody has an accurate count of who, who this is, uh, how many people we're having. Um, if they do, please come forward, but we haven't been able to find an accurate count of how many people are out there. Uh, we will probably have the only accurate count uh, or the nearest accurate count once we're done with this program. Okay, um, thanks. Um, my other question is about um, 
people in the state who are advocating against vaccination, of which there are a few. Um, one of them is actually a postal worker in Essex County, which might account for some of their disparity. Um, but as far as public officials go, as you guys already know, the, the, the select board in Stanford has been pretty clear about um, counteracting the message about vaccines and the dangers of the virus. And I'm wondering, um, you know, since this is a long-term and very coordinated strategy that you have to put out this message, is there anything more you can do to address public officials who are putting out the opposite message? Um, you know, we're going to continue uh, to try and educate uh, and advocate for people to get their vaccinations when they are able. Um, we've, I think it's proven uh, that it's safe, it's reliable. Um, just look at our numbers. Uh, we, we were able to reduce the number of deaths and hospitalizations uh, amongst those 65 and over significantly. And uh, the, the data just backs that up. So um, I know the, on the call with the White House as well, uh, they had brought this up. Uh, they are working on a campaign, uh, a nationwide campaign, and uh, trying to, uh, for those who are hesitant to obtain the vaccine, trying to connect with them. Um, but we're all ears. We're going to continue to do everything we can. If anyone has any ideas on how to get through to people, uh, we'd like to hear them uh, because uh, obviously we don't have uh, all that. Um, we don't have all the answers uh, to that. But uh, for the most part, I mean, I have to say, when you look at the number of people, I haven't received uh, the update, but we opened up 50 and over uh, on yesterday. And uh, I think there was 20 something thousand by last night. I don't know what it is today. 21,000 at this point. So that was uh, significant in a day. And when you see the number of people uh, who are vaccinated in that 65 and over range, um, it's, a, it's a good sign um, in, in getting in the upper 80s uh, in a couple of those age bands. So we'll continue to do all we can. If anyone has any ideas, please let us know. All right. Um, thank you very much. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, I think this question is for Secretary Smith. I want to return to Liam Elder Connor's question about vaccines for BIPOC prisoners. Secretary Smith, I heard you explain the state's plan for vaccinating incarcerated people by age bands. Did I understand correctly that incarcerated, that the incarcerated BIPOC population will be vaccinated separately from those age bands that you spelled out? The answer is yes. Um, what, if you're going to, the way that we've been doing it with uh, corrections, that if you're eligible in the general population, you're eligible within the facility. So if there's a, 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 a member of the BIPOC community in our uh, facility, then yes, they would be eligible for immediate um, uh, vaccination, as would uh, 55, uh, 16 to 55, that would be eligible for um, uh, high-risk conditions. Great, thank you. And then I think the second question is for Dr. Levine. On Friday, Secretary French said that surveillance testing for educators would be phased out. Does this mean that people who've been getting um, prophylactically tested each week can and should also phase out their testing once they're fully vaccinated? When you're saying people, are you talking about just general people in the in the state or in, in the education community? Well, Secretary French explained that surveillance testing for educators would likely to be phased out since they're actively being vaccinated. So my question from people in our community who okay. are getting tested on a regular basis, should once they're fully vaccinated, can they also phase out testing? Yeah, so... Um, they're doing surveillance on themselves is what you're saying because they're just regularly yeah. getting tested. Yeah. Uh, so we believe the best benefit from surveillance testing will come from those who have yet not yet had the opportunity to be vaccinated. So uh, early on, I have no objection to people getting tested as well, but some of the data I just presented this morning from the um, Pfizer-Moderna uh, CDC report 
uh, basically indicated that there's a marked decrease in the ability of uh, nasal swabs to turn positive in people who have been vaccinated uh, with that regimen. So I would not recommend they continue to do surveillance uh, testing on themselves at that point in time. But there'll still be plenty of people who have not yet been vaccinated who should continue that if that's what they've been doing. And with regard to what Secretary French said, um, the, the teacher population, if it has a high enough uptake of vaccine, just doesn't make for a viable population to do surveillance testing on. But that doesn't mean other groups that are getting surveillance testing should just phase out on their own because uh, they may not be actually being vaccinated with a strategy like we're using for the teachers. So if there are work sites that are having routine surveillance testing done and they have a heterogeneity of people of different ages and different jobs at those work sites, uh, they're probably uh, worth continuing doing the strategy they're doing as, as, as they are now. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I, this would be for the governor. Um, so on town meeting day, Montgomery up here um, opted in for a tax and regulate market for marijuana. And with uh, members now appointed to the Cannabis Control Board, what are sort of the next steps uh, at the municipal level for towns like Montgomery? And sort of alongside that, uh, why was the definition of cannabis changed from an agricultural product to commercial good? Yeah, I don't have the answers to that, Cameron. Um, you might want to connect when, when possible um, with the chair of this new commission, although uh, they've just been named. Uh, they haven't met formally at this point, um, so they haven't gotten their legs underneath them at, at uh, this point in time. But I would say in the very near future, uh, some of those questions should be directed to them and uh, they should be, have the answers. Okay, and the um, the only other thing I wanted to ask about is with spring sports kind of right around the corner, is there any guidance at this time that the state is looking at? I believe so. I don't know if Secretary Moore is on at this point. I am, Governor. Uh, yes, the, the school-based spring sports guidance has been published and is available on the Agency of Education website. Um, we are working on recreational sports guidance, um, an update to it, and anticipate um, publishing that in the next week. All right. Thank you so much. Avery, WCAX. Governor, with the rising case numbers, has this changed what you plan to announce in terms of your reopening blueprint? No, um, not at all. It's just a trying to tie up all the loose ends. But um, because we're tying it all, the blueprint will look uh, at uh, the vaccination rates and milestones along the way. Uh, we feel confident, uh, especially with what we've seen thus far from the data in terms of those 65 and over, we've already vaccinated. Hospitalizations are down significantly, deaths are down significantly. So the more people we vaccinate, uh, the lower numbers we'll see. So um, it won't change our strategy. And uh, we, uh, we think this will provide um, some assurance as to what we're going to be doing over the next three months as we work towards normalcy. It seems like we're seeing more schools lately go to remote learning due to either cases in the school or just low staffing because of cases. Are we seeing more transmission within our schools right now? I don't know if it's within our schools. Um, Dr. Levine may be able to answer that better. Uh, but certainly from the outsides, the community activity uh, has uh, shown that there's more uh, viral activity uh, within the community. So that enters the school from that, from that way. Dr. Levine. And, that, and that's exactly what we are seeing. But you are correct. Um, there are more schools that have been impacted by cases. Secretary French may have some more insight into uh, the numbers that have been severely impacted in terms of their staffing needs uh, at this point in time, because I'm, I'm not uh, aware of that. I just know that 
the numbers of schools with cases have increased, but the majority of them, to my knowledge, uh, with some notable exceptions that have been discussed at the press conferences, have remained in operation. Has this given you all any pause? Sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, this is Dr. I was just going to add, you know, echoing Dr. Levine's comments, uh, you know, definitely uh, more cases and then, uh, you know, sort of the, the related impact of uh, quarantining and so forth has put pressure on staffing patterns as we've seen all along, but it's definitely uh, a lot of activity right now and that's definitely impacted school operations in the last couple of weeks. Does that mean it's not a good idea to put high school kids back into school full time? Yeah, as in, far as the earlier, in terms of the earlier question relative to reopening, uh, you know, our guidance is still on track. I think the publication next week, um, and it is, I mean, it certainly gives us pause looking at the case counts that are out now, but at the same time, you know, a lot of what's behind the CDC recommendation to change the distancing is. Some of the studies are pointing to the fact there's really no significant difference between the three feet, six feet. Um, so, um, you know, I think right now, you know, in our confidence and where the numbers are heading relative to vaccination, um, we're still on track to, um, you know, implement that recommendation from the CDC in the coming weeks. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Uh, before you came on, there was some discussion about um, people jockeying for different vaccination appointments. And I was wondering if, you know, and Mike Smith mentioned that um, the pharmacies are also opening up new sites. Can people um, switch their second vaccine site to a place that might be uh, closer instead of driving for some time? Secretary Smith. Yeah, Tim, this uh, question came up last uh, press conference, um, and it makes it logistically difficult if you get vaccinated in one place and try to vaccinate in, in another in trying to make sure uh, that we can keep track of uh, various people. And one site might be doing Moderna, another site might be doing Pfizer, and it may switch. So it's better to, uh, and we have encouraged people that if you make an appointment at a site that you return to the same site uh, for your second vaccination. It just makes it a lot easier and it ensures that there's no mix-ups along the way. And it also makes sure that we don't have extra vaccine at one site and, uh, and, and vaccine goes to waste. So, so the bottom line is no. The, the bottom line is no. Basically. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thank you. I don't know if this question is for Commissioner Pichek or for Dr. Levine. Uh, going back to uh, the deck that you supplied today with the Vermont forecast and showing it increasing through the month of April, I was curious for a little more understanding of the CDC ensemble forecast. I understand that they take different methodologies and mix them together to try to make sure they have a more accurate projection. But is that projection uh, comparing what their projection for the state of Vermont is or for the U.S. average? Commissioner Pichak. Hey, Tom, thank you for the uh, question. So that uh, is the Vermont model. So, you know, there are anywhere between 30 and 50 modelers that uh, at this point submit models to the CDC, Oliver Wyman, which again, we've relied on from the beginning of the pandemic, participates in that modeling. Uh, but then um, they also submit individual state models as well. So about 31 modelers have submitted an individual model for Vermont, and then the CDC aggregates them to create an ensemble model. Generally, you know, the more methodologies, the more um, forecasts that you include, you would generally see the more stable, more accurate prediction. Um, Oliver Wyman basically competed with the ensemble model for accuracy uh, throughout uh, the fall and into the winter. So we like to look at both of them, um, but that ensemble model is specific to Vermont. Thanks. So uh, looking at that, it, 
did the did CDC ensemble come out uh, before Oliver Wyman, or did they come out at the same time? Yeah, good question. So Oliver Wyman was updated on Monday. The CDC was updated through last night, so pretty much the same time. Got it. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, one last question uh, for the governor. Uh, governor, I talked to you last week about the expanded bottle bill, which looks like it may possibly be seen to come to a vote. Um, Compass Vermont did its own survey of both redemption centers and of uh, the general population throughout the state. Uh, and we came up with about 91% people in the state, uh, at least in favor of increasing containers to plastic and wine bottles and water bottles. Uh, more, uh, more sort of on the cusp about the 10 cent deposit. Um, my question to you is if, if this, if this bill goes through knowing how you feel about it, do you think you'll sign it or veto it? Oh, it's got a long ways to go before I make that determination. But, uh, Again, it's it's complicated. It's not just. I mean, we all want our uh, roadways to be cleaned up. We don't want uh, there to be debris uh, seen. Uh, so, I can, I understand uh, some folks need or, or desire uh, to have plastic water bottles uh, included or wine bottles and others, um, but. Um, it gets pretty complicated uh, when you think about that and the magnitude and the facilities necessary to accommodate that. Um, I, I remember a I remember a Seinfeld episode uh, where there was a lot of bottles coming from other areas uh, into one community uh, that they were cashing in on. So uh, this would be much more difficult than some people would imagine. So I just think we have to be um, recognize that, uh, cognizant of that, and uh, may, make sure that we, you know, get the desired uh, goal of uh, cleaning up the roadways, if that's what the goal is. Again, I still see we have a uh, container a law here uh, and um, a bottle bill, and I still see um, those that can be redeemed along the roadway. So that doesn't fix the problem, and it could just complicate things. So uh, it's fair for me to say you're, you're, you'll hold judgment until you see whether the bill actually comes to your desk. Yeah, I, I do that with anything. Um, you know, look uh, at the bill um, as it moves its way through the legislature, add um, my input along the way and uh, the input of our, uh, of our administration, and uh, then see where it goes and uh, make a determination after it's passed fully uh, by both bodies um, as to whether I'd sign it or not. Okay, thank you very much. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, yes, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Governor Scott, we've uh, noticed in, in recent weeks, uh, we've taken note that you've come to these Tuesday uh, press sessions directly from your conversations with the White House. And I'm just wondering uh, how the tenor of uh, and content of those um, those meetings each week compare under the Biden administration to those that you might have had with Vice, Vice President uh, Pence and the, the COVID response team in the Trump administration? Um, you know, they're just different in some regards. I think they were um, both widely attended. Uh, they were uh, governors from both sides of the aisle on the meetings. The, uh, um, the meetings with uh, Vice President uh, Pence were a little longer, uh, to be honest. Um, but uh, but we, uh, you know, we wait uh, now. It, you know, it's different now because we're we're all waiting for our allocation. Uh, so uh, this is uh, timely from our perspective to be able to mm -hmm. tell uh, the general public what's happening uh, on a real time in real time. So um, so we wait for that, and uh, they're only 45 minutes long. Um, so uh, governors are a few governors are allowed to ask questions and and you learn something about what other governors are thinking at that point too so but that's that was the case previously uh, and they're all they, mm -hmm. they were cordial before they're cordial today ah, thank you very much yep.
Uh, Governor, I have two vaccine side effect questions. Uh, first, one of my readers wants to know if with teens soon to be receiving the vaccine, if possible impacts on current or future pregnancies have been thoroughly studied and what has been learned, how sure are we that vaccines are safe for pregnancies? So that was two questions. So the first question um, is a little premature to answer because we're talking about future pregnancies for a vaccine that has been out um, you know, less than a year, really. We're getting data all the time from the original trials because those people are being followed up. So that's that will be important. There's been no um, known impact at this point in time. But again, when you're talking future, you're usually talking more than months or a year. So have to just qualify that answer that way. Um, but certainly nothing concerning at this point in time. And the data on pregnancy is increasing all of the time. And there are now uh, pregnant women enrolled in trials. So we're going to learn a lot more about this. But the consensus of the obstetrics and gynecology community and all of their uh, guideline setting panels and advisory panels uh, is coming out on the side of definitely uh, recommending this vaccine to women after uh, a shared decision making process can occur. And it's doing that because there is a notable slight increase in risk to the woman and a slight increase in risk to the developing fetus uh, from active coronavirus infection. So the hope is that the vaccine would reduce the likelihood of both of those untoward events. So it's an evolving science, as is so many parts of our pandemic. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, th this next question is from our old friend, Steve Merrill. Uh, Moderna vaccine patent uh, says, um, mentions using, quote, antimicrobial polypeptides that, quote, it, from, from the patent, uh, may block fusion viral entry by one or more enveloped viruses, e.g. HIV, HCV, uh, hepatitis C. Uh, are, are there HIV or hep C uh, parts in these vaccines? And this would be the Moderna vaccine? And if so, is that of concern? I have no awareness of there being either of those as part of the vaccine. Um, we can look into this further. It's nothing I've ever heard uh, about. Because it's, it's right there in the patent language, and it's just, I mean, in black and white and all, and this kind of raises the question, uh, you know, what's, is there a concern there? Is that something that, that uh, you could follow up on? We'll do my best. Thank you. Hi, a question for the governor about S100, the bill to provide universal school meals to Vermont children. Uh, your office has previously expressed concerns about any aspect of this proposal that could lead to increased taxes. I wonder, in its current form, would you veto this bill? Oh, that, way too soon. I, I don't even, I haven't even looked at it myself. Uh, is it passed out of the House? Is it in the Senate at this point? Or is it, what? what uh, it is in the Senate currently. And what was the bill number? S100. So it hasn't, has it, it hasn't made it to the floor of the Senate even at this point? I think that's correct. Yeah, it, way too early uh, for me to weigh in on that one. I, uh, I wonder, do you broadly share the goal that the legislature find a way to get this done this year uh, to, you know, provide find a way to provide universal school meals? I think we're we're working with them, and we'll continue uh, to do whatever we can to assist in that way, uh, but. Um, but I'd also say that I'm, I'm not, uh, as you noted, uh, I'm not advocating for any tax increases either. Okay, thank you. Paige, the Vermont Cynic. Hi there. Um, I have a question 
about vaccinations for college students. Um, a lot of students are starting to think about how they will get vaccinated, and I have some evidence that there are students who have already been vaccinated, whether they're out-of-staters or not. Um, I have a question. Can out-of-state students get vaccinated because they have on-campus addresses or they lease addresses in Burlington? They'd have to be, at this point in time, they'd have to be a, a Vermont resident. Uh, if they're a college student and they're a Vermont resident, then they could be vaccinated. Uh, if they uh, maintain their out-of-state status, uh, then they cannot at this point in time. Now, uh, depending on what we get for a supply when we get to the end, uh, we may be able to fulfill uh, that and, and offer it to those uh, from out of state. But at this point in time, we want to make sure we take care of Vermonters first and uh, as other states have done as well. And we'll uh, and then we'll move on to the next phase if possible. But that will be after we get okay. through 16 and over uh, Vermont students and our Vermont population. Okay, thank you. And has there been any further discussion with the university of how the student population will be addressed in the vaccination process, given that that April 19th date is rapidly approaching? Dr. Levine. I want to remind you that the April 19th date is the date you're eligible and you can make your appointment on the website. So the concern is by the time you would get your appointment, will you still be on campus or not? But let's assume in the best of all worlds, appointments are readily available and students can get vaccinated uh, in a timely way while they're still uh, part of the spring semester. We have talked actively with all of the campuses around the state, uh, partnering with them to make sure the vaccine could get to them uh, as opposed to making the students drive to some site uh, where they might not even have cars to, to be able to drive to. Uh, the campuses all have health centers um, and a staff that are eager to uh, participate in this as well. So I'm sure when, when and if we would get to that point, we uh, have had preliminary discussions, nothing put down and set in stone about how the vaccine could be deployed on campus as opposed to making people travel off campus. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday.